the morning? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord, for the access of coming into your presence. And if we really would think about it, we would just be in trembling and awe because of who you really are, that you would allow your mere creatures like us who are flawed and sinful, and you are so holy. Uh, we should just rejoice that in your goodness you have made a way that we might even just be able to speak with you. And so, Lord, um, I pray for each man here in each man's battle, where he is in his walk with you, where we are with our families, and where we are with our children and grandchildren, and some of us with great-grandchildren. And Lord, that you may help us as men to be uh, the exact place that we need to be uh, in our roles, in our families, and in our society, and in our church, that we would rise to the occasion as you would lead to lead uh, our homes and to lead our churches and to lead our communities for the glory of your precious name. It's not easy, especially in the day and age that we are living in, for we would get trouble on every side. So there is a tendency, O oh God, for us just to say somebody else take it. I don't want the hassle. I don't want the responsibility. I don't want to do it. May that not be here, Lord. Every man, wherever he is, and whatever things that you have called him to do, he would rise up to the occasion by the power of the Spirit and walk and lead and live to the glory of your precious name. Our country's in trouble, Lord, because we're sinners. And we need godly men in leadership to stand. And in nowadays, if you stand, you catch all kinds of trouble. So help us, help men especially Christian men, Lord, to be true to their walk and live in such a way that would please you. Hmm. We pray for our midterm elections, Lord, that's coming up, that you might have mercy upon us again. And now we turn to the Word today, Lord. I need your help as we would look at such passages that many people never read or skip over. And yet there is indeed a lesson here. Come teach us, Lord. Come, Lord. And teach us your precious word. In Christ's name, amen. Well, we're coming to the end of Romans chapter 16. Instead of reading chapter 16, 1 through 16, as I usually do of our text, I want us to turn to Philippians chapter 3 to introduce ourselves to this. For he is now dealing with individual lives. How many of you in Romans, when you get to this section, kind of fly through it, right? So, eh, you know, this is what Paul's talking about with different individuals, but there are specific lessons that we are here. And I want to begin with by turning to Philippians chapter 3 and begin <clears throat> with the first few verses there, because I think it will 
help us to see why Paul is placing these names in the book. It has to do with fellowship with one another. Do you realize that Paul has never been to Rome to visit these people? And how many people do we see here? A bunch. And so evidently he knew of these people in some way. And he begins to mention them there. Um, as a pastor in, in times past, I would take the congregation role every week and pray for them. Just go down the row each week. Usually fasting once a week, uh, once a week, uh, a day a week. Besides praying for them especially some of those who I knew were struggling in the faith. And so in the section in Romans 16, which we're going to look at in just a moment, Paul begins to make it very personal, individual. I hope you have individuals on your list of prayer. Every one of you are on my prayer list, which I pray for every week and uh, that we might be men that would uh, live in such a way that would honor the king. So let's look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 1, <clears throat> when Paul says, Finally, brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me, and it is a safeguard for you. And I have hit the wrong chapter. How about Philippians chapter 2, verse 1? If therefore there is any encouragement in Christ, if there is any consolation of love, any uh, influence of love, if there is any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affections and compassion, whoa, what a what a one verse. Then he says, if that is all true, if there's any of that, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, and united in spirit, intent on one purpose. Man, I tell you what, if that would happen in a church, look out of the unity in such a way. doesn't mean we're a unanimity, but there is one thing or several things that it means more to us than some of the other things that brings unity within the body. And of course, that should be Jesus Christ, right? And what he has done for us. Verse 2, Make my joy complete by being of the same mind maintaining the same love, united in spirit, intent on one purpose, do nothing, the others are positive, now he's doing the negative, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with <clears throat> humility of mind, each of you regard one another more important than himself. I think better translated, more of a priority. Nobody's more important than somebody else. But we should have more of a priority. More as more of a priority than himself. Do not merely look out for your own interest, but also for the interest of others. So when I was looking at these group of people that we're about to look at in Romans chapter 16, I thought about this text. I sat back after I finished my lesson and I said to myself, what text of Scripture does this remind or what passage should I turn to, Lord, to introduce this section that deals with people? And this one in Philippians came to mind. So let's now look now at, at uh, Romans chapter 16. The 
the notes up here. He begins by saying, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church, which is at Centria. We'll look at Centria in a few minutes. That you receive her in the Lord in a, a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in whatever matter she may have in need of you, for she herself has been a helper of many and of myself as well. Well, what a commendation for that young for that person, huh? As uh, her name, I mean, we have to look at everything. Her name is taken after the, the moon goddess, uh, Artemis, or we would, uh, uh, Diana. And so thus she was probably a Gentile that came to faith in Christ. We know she was converted. She comes from the, a town near in Corinth, which is nine miles uh, east of Corinth at Centria, uh, and um, the tradition indicates she was probably the carrier of the letter called Romans. <laughs> so tradition puts it that she is the one that carried this precious cargo that we have been studying for over three years. She is a servant. That's an interesting word. It's the Greek word for diakonos. Diakonos of the church generally means a servant in general, but the word can have a technical meaning of what we know about as a, a deacon in the church. And so there is that debate whether um, uh, Phoebe was a deaconess in the church, which we will look at in just a moment. And it has an article with the, of the church, so many people say, well, surely she is a technical deaconess in the church. Well, let's take a look at that. You have to turn over, so we'll time out here and go to 1 Timothy, <clears throat> because this is where you would find the possibility of that terminology in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. <clears throat> we begin with verse 8, and I, you will notice that the, he speaks about male deacons in verses 8 through 10 and 12 through 13. I think that's important to see. Um, and then, I'm not going to read those things, but then in verse 11, we come to the text that says, and it begins with, in English here, the word women in my New American Standard Bible, it's the Greek word gunikos, and gunikos can have the meaning of woman or wife, depending on the context. And they have decided to um, translate this woman. Um, it is interesting to me that Paul would talk about a, a male deacon between eight, 8 and 10 and then sandwich in a female deacon and then go back to the male deacon. It doesn't seem to be the, the, the flow that would be thinking that that would be that way. He would say male deacons, and then he would deal with female deacons. And so with the context, I would say that this, I would rather translate this passage, wife of the deacon. And so if you're going to have a deaconess, I would say every wife of a deacon would be a deaconess that she would need to qualify. And uh, in, in saying that, then, it, it would be part of the qualification because since deacons often help, she could help him do his ministry. You say, well, why isn't there a, uh, 
uh, a qualification for the wife of an elder bishop. And I'd say it's because she would be leading in the congregation, according to the text and my understanding and others, that, the, the, that, the, that females are not to be involved in leading or teaching men in public. And so therefore, um, she could disqualify him, but she has no qualification because she could not help in a technical or in a, any public way. But as a deacon, absolutely. Now, is there different positions on that? Well, of course, on that. So the positions would be that there are, is a standalone deaconesses. Some people think there is no deaconesses at all. And then my position would be that the wives of deacons uh, would be deaconesses in the church. Now, uh, back to Romans 16, I would take, However you take that, my understanding is how you're going to take this. Uh, because we're all diakonoses in one sense, in the general sense. We all should be ministers in the sense of that. But again, this word can have a technical sense. We often call the office of deacon, which is... Um, a word that's not used with it, but we can use that in, to make it the technical sense of the term. Um, and what you, if you think it's the technical sense, then you would say uh, that that would be here. If, if, uh, but I think it, in a general sense, she was a servant of the church. It wasn't until the third century that de uh, deaconesses appear as a group of individuals uh, with specific ministries. I like Dr. Ryrie's on that. He did his doctoral dissertation, I think, at Edinburgh on uh, the role of women in the church and wrote a book on it. Well, any questions on that? All right, let's move on. All right. She was a helper, okay? It's an interesting word uh, to many and to, to Paul specifically, and whatever she needs, Paul would say, help her. A patron uh, 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 was one who came to the aid of others, especially foreigners, by providing housing and financial and by representing their interests before the local authority. So therefore, she must be an influential person. She was probably well off and was using her wealth for the things of God. She Shintria's status as a business seaport would make it imperative that a Christian in its, and its church take up the ministry on behalf of visiting Christians for hospitality. And so Phoebe then was probably a woman of high social standings and some wealth who put her status, her resources, and time at the service of traveling Christians like Paul who needed help and support. Now remember, where is Paul going? For, uh, he wants to go through Rome, but where is he going? He's going to Spain. And he said, I want, and he says, I, I, I'm going to drop by Rome <laughs> that you might help me along to Spain. And notice in the same way, bringing that church in to the ministry of looking to missions of somewhere else. Sure. She could have been, but we don't know. Yeah, that, you know that he didn't mention his uh, his uh, her and his the husband. So the the natural tendency is to say she was a widow, or she could be that her husband wasn't a believer. You just have to take in the copy, but it, it, you, it's, 
you have to be careful when something is not stated what you put in there. It's called <laughs> trying to get something out of silence, right? So it, I don't mind thinking about it. I think, I, I, you know, I thought the same thing. I said, well, you know, where's the husband? What's the deal on that? I don't know. It's amazing that if we go to other places that some of the prominent women, they don't mention their husbands either. Dorcas and some others, you know. So, interesting. Now, she was introduced to the fellowship of Rome and was recommended by Paul to be accepted. Now, this is a very practical way to be accepted quickly in a fellowship, especially in the first century when you have itinerant preachers and itinerant people going around wanting to have uh, somebody to put them up and to help them along. Uh, and uh, John will say in first, uh, second and third John that, that if they are not believers, don't put them up, okay? You might want to help them a little bit, just being kind to any unbeliever, but you don't act like they are believers, and give them fellowship if they are heretics and trying to sway the church to a different place. But it's interesting, um, this was a very practical way to be, be accepted quickly, is uh, uh, to be mentioned by Paul within the letter that she seen or possibly could be carrying because what do they do with letters? in the first century. What did Paul admonish in other places in, uh, uh, we call them letters or books of the New Testament? What did he tell the, the people with, that he would uh, 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 talk about? What would they, sh they should read the letter, read it publicly, and then read the one, if you watch it in Colossians, read the one that's coming from Laodicea. I mean, they were cyclical letters for which Paul was passing around and reading to the different congregations? Absolutely. So you wonder, it, were they copied? Well, it never says that, but would you copy it? Yeah, I mean, he's an apostle. <laughs> you know, I don't, hey, this one was supposed to go down to Laodicea, but, you know, well, let's copy it and keep it here. Now, I, don't, I can't prove that. But uh, I think that's one of the reasons why things were being copied. So why am I mentioning this? What if in God's providence you have to go somewhere or to another part of the country uh, to live? And uh, you have to now check out different churches. Would it be wise for you, the, the fellowship, that the, the church that you are uh, attending and in good standing and they know you well, to get a letter of recommendation so that when you go there, you can give them a letter from another church? How much more easily it is for them to be able to accept you and maybe quicker into leadership and into um, and teaching because they have a letter that is recommended from the elders of whatever church you're attending. Isn't that interesting? I think it would be. And in a sense, this is what's happening here, a letter of recommendation. So think about that uh, as you, I hope you don't have, if you're a Bethelite, that you don't have, have to go, but if you do, this would be a important instrument when you would go a different place. Any questions on that? Comments? All right. Now let's turn secondly to Prisca or Priscilla and Aquila. Isn't that interesting that he's, he mentions um, Prisca first? Uh, then uh, Aquila. The couple was, was driven uh, from Rome. Uh, uh, I'm reading some things and now putting them into the text uh, or in, our, in the lecture. Uh, probably about 51 AD when 
Claudius, which was, is mentioned, who died about 54 A.D., commanded all Jews to leave Rome. So hold your place here and turn over to Acts 18 so we can catch up why I said what I said. Acts 18, verse 2 and 3. I'll read verse 1 also. And after these things, he left Athens, uh, Paul did, and went to Corinth. Now, I'm going to show you where Corinth is. I don't know if it's on the map if you can see it, but it's over there on, on uh, this side here, I think. Is it? No, other side. <laughs> I'm, reading, I'm looking at it from different Annie's point. And you also see uh, there also Centria, which is not too uh, uh, far from Corinth, right? So um, he's speaking about that. So he uh, left Athens and went to Corinth and found a certain Jew that, uh, named Aquila, native of Pontus. So again, uh, you will notice at the very top of the map, that you have Bithynia and Pontus. Now, what, what area is that today? Know your geography? You got the Black Sea above that. You have the Mediterranean Sea below that. So that's Turkey. Okay? Okay. So that's the area of Turkey for all these churches that were involved in that. So Bithynia and Pontus up here near the Black Sea. Okay? All right, getting our geography today. Uh, having recently come from Italy, I'm sure you know where Italy is, with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he came to them. And because he was of the same trade, Paul was, he stayed with them and they were working, for by trade they were tent makers. So they had a common bond, didn't they? Because they had a common trade and also the common Lord. And so they departed and came to Corinth when Paul connects up with them because Aquila and Paul were both tent makers and they became lifelong loyal friends of Paul. Now Paul left them in Ephesus. Notice in verse 19 of Acts 18, it says, and they, well, let me read 18, uh, 18, Acts 18, 18. And Paul, having remained many days longer, looked, um, took leave of the brethren and put out to sea for, for Syria. And with him were Priscilla and Aquila in Centria. He had his hair cut and for he was keeping a vow, and they came to Ephesus, and they left them there. Left them who? Aquila and Priscilla, okay? So now they have gone from Corinth across the sea there, the Aegean Sea, to the area what we call Turkey today, to uh, the circle there, which is Ephesus. And Paul then left uh, Priscilla and Aquila in Ephesus. Okay? All right. Now, we don't know if they ever returned to Rome. There is some speculation, since that was their home, that when uh, Claudius died in 54, which is three years later approximately, probably, something around there, and uh, did they go back home? I don't know. And, uh, but um, that's who 
Priscilla and Aquila. Priscilla and Aquila would listen to Apollos, who was eloquent in his speaking. And, but what, one thing that Apollos had not heard from was the further understanding that Jesus is the Christ and that he died and was buried and rose again because he was only telling them about John the Baptist. You, you, you see, things don't, you can't text somebody in the uh, first century, see? Uh, news didn't travel as fast today. So we, we see that Priscilla and Aquila would take Apollos aside and get him up to speed, and he was so excited about that that he had the doctor now more sure and that the Messiah had come whom he had believed in. All right. Now you'll notice back in uh, Romans chapter 16, verse 5, that he says, greet the church that's in the house, in their house, of course, dealing with uh, Priscilla and Aquila's house. And so I, I, I uh, most of my students don't think about, you know, well, you know, they think about a church, they think of North America and United States in the 21st century. <laughs> well, uh, I had the privilege that when I came out of Dallas Seminary in 1979 and wanted to go into the ministry, that God was pleased to allow me to go to Kerrville, Texas. And there was a body of believers there that had been uh, studying the Bible, and it was a Bible study. Um, Dr. Randall Price was involved going back and forth from seminary down to that area to teach the Bible study. And... Dr. Price, my good friend, was going to um, uh, Israel to, uh, to university there to get further uh, study, and he needed somebody to take their place. And if God is pleased to start a church. And so I said, sure. It seemed to be a fit. God seemed to be leading. So my wife and I and our two-and-a-half-year-old child and our brand-new child, you know, my <laughs> My son, my second son was born the day after I graduated from Dallas Seminary. <laughs> and off I went to Kerrville, Texas. And God was pleased to start a church in someone's house. So we had a house church for I don't know how many months until God was pleased to get a building for us. We did it kind of backwards. We found a building that was... Um, kind of a military building and we moved it to the place of the of the property that we had so we we moved the building to the to the land instead of building the uh, building on the land and that became the starting of it and it's amazing to me that um, some people looked upon us well when you become a church I'll come to your church in other words when you get a building but that didn't make it that didn't make a church we were already a church. Uh, it's just that part of it is cultural, especially in America. A lot of churches. We could speak uh, to our brother Frank and others in China and other places that, uh, that have house churches. And uh, we even have house churches in the United States. There are some people, that's what they do and how they start churches. But anyway, churches were started in homes and church buildings did not come into existence until the third century. Why the third century? I've said that a couple times now, haven't I? Well, that's when Christianity came out from underneath the rocks, I call it, because it had to hide because of persecution, but it's now being accepted by society and um, with Constantine. And so therefore they could come out and have buildings and be accepted among the society, which he dubbed that Christian, right? And Christianity came above board. And so there are different house churches. Turn over to 1 Corinthians, hold your place here, 16, verse 19. 
1 Corinthians 16, 19, and he speaks about the churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Priscilla greet you in heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. So again, here's uh, a little verse that you probably just run over real quick at the end of 1 Corinthians now coming to play here because there is a house church in it. Uh, in this text of Romans 16, we have three house churches and possibly two others in Aristopolis and Narcissus possibility. Other places that ch house churches are men mentioned in Colossians 4, 15 and 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 19. And that was a common thing in the first century. Any questions, any thoughts, comments about house churches? I just said, I'm so glad I started in house churches. Frank. Yeah, well, it started there because that's the natural thing. Uh, I, I'm, I've come to understand that my gifts, talents, and my personality and everything, I, I, big church, I just wouldn't, I wouldn't do well. I, I, I mean, I'd do the best I could. But I'm a small person. I'm a small, I'm in a small frame. I mean, because my, my wife has a ho gift of hospitality, we ask uh, everybody in our church, uh, uh, as long as I was a pastor, at least once one, into, our, into our home, at least once every year. Doesn't mean they came, but they, they, were, they were asked into my home so that we might uh, know them better and be able to um, pray for them and be involved. Uh, I had a, uh, you know, those of you who've been with me so long, uh, in this study is that I used to tell them, you know, if, if I ask you, hello, uh, how you doing? You can have to do anything. But if I say, how is your soul? Don't mess with me. Tell me exactly how your soul is. And then I would say, if you tell me that your soul is well every time, I, you're probably lying, right? Because I, I don't do always well. I want to do well. And then your spirituality would then be, what do you do and how do you do and how well do you do when your soul is not well? Ah, that'll show you maturity. Because we're, we can't always be well. But we can do well when our soul is not well. And that demonstrates the maturity or the lack thereof. So here in house churches, got us to talk about spirituality, didn't it? And shepherding the flock of God. Then we begin with individuals that we don't know much about. Uh, Epinetus, we don't know in, in, five, in um, 16, 5, found nowhere in the, else in the New Testament, beloved as the first convert to Christ in Asia. How's that? What kind of title did you have on that one? That would be great, wouldn't it? First convert. Well, wasn't up to you anyway, as the Lord was pleased to draw him, of course. Then in verse 6, we have Mary. And Mary is a common name of the first century. And it was characteristic of Mary is that she was a hard worker. And so she finds her way in the New Testament. Then in verse 7, we come to Junius, or it could be translated Junia. Uh, um, not, uh, it should not be, if, uh, uh, if the person is a male or a female, it, uh, is, the, is the difficulty here. Um, uh, it, it says that this person is a kinsman, and so 
If you, Paul usually uses that terminology as a kinsman means that the person is a Jew, and so we know seem to be Jewish because if it's not, Paul has about six different relatives in his <laughs> in the Church of Rome. I don't think that's happening. So when he means kinsman, he doesn't talk. He's not talking about next of kin. He's talking about someone who is a Jew like he is. So. Um, The, whether this is a male or female, it depends on how you accent the Greek word. Uh, Lunaean is the Greek word. Interpreters from the 13th to the 20th century have generally favored a masculine identity. Uh, uh, Junius or uh, Juninus is what they would say. And then before the 13th century and back, they generally interpreted it as a female, Junia. See, seems possible that she was the wife of Andronicus, and so this would be a female. That's how I've taken it, many others, of them being together. So in verse 7, when he says, greet Andronicus, uh, and Andronicus and Junius, um, the Junia is how I would probably do that, uh, who are st stated to be, uh, my text, who are outstanding among the apostles. Now, if these two were apostles, they were not apostles in the technical sense. Apostolos in Greek means sent one. And again, just like diakonos, it has a general term and it can also have a technical term. The technical term would be the 12 apostles. But the word is also used if you were a, uh, designated by your church to go certain place and do a certain function of the church, you would be an apostle of that church. It's not a, a chosen one to go and do a specific task, but you would not have the gift of apostleship. You got me? So that word can be used in uh, uh, a technical sense or in a non-technical sense. And if it were an apostle, not the gift of apostle, they were sent ones from the local church to do things for the church. But more likely, the phrase should be translated outstanding to the apostle, not among them as though they're one of them. Uh, so it should be translated to the apostles the apostles of Christ, and it would be more likely because the article is used with the apostles, which is, in most other places, it's used for the twelve. So they were outstanding to the apostles in the sense of their ministry of what they did in the first, year, in the first century. Their godly work, their uh, early conversion pop, uh, before Paul's conversion, probably an older saint. They were possibly pillars and leaders for the young saints to look up to and was worthy to comment on. Now, am I taking some license and some possibilities in, in the text? Well, yeah, I am. I don't know that for sure. But by the comments for which Paul makes this, uh, it's... Uh, outstanding among uh, uh, to the apostles also uh, were in uh, Christ before me. In other words, they came to faith before Paul. There's got to be some years down the road. Are you with me? And so maybe these were some of the older saints for the local church and they were using their gift for a long period of time and the apostles have recognized them. And so does Paul being in the faith before him. Now, when did Paul come to faith? Acts 9, right? As you say, yeah. <laughs> whatever that date is, right? In the 30s. Okay. Sure. Well, um, it seems to be correct. 
You're right. Very good observation, Lawrence. Because Paul is looking at that church, Rome, and saying, hey. And so Phoebe is the only one not because traditionally she is bringing the letter and being recommended so that she might be able to minister there in Rome. Excellent. This couple, Andronicus and Junia, may have been in Jerusalem with Stephen, was martyred. I'm speculating, and were forced out in the persecution that followed. Remember, they were they were a, a lot of the saints were were pushed out of Jerusalem after Stephen was, though the apostles stayed in Jeru in Jerusalem. Um, so they knew the ups and downs of the Christian life possibility, and they asserted their maturity in all areas of their lives in the church, the church life. And I don't know if I am correct on, on all of this, but I picture them as the seasoned saints that have not hit the rocking chair, but have continued to serve faithfully their Lord. They knew the price and the privilege to serve the Savior. They were fellow prisoners and outstanding in the estimation of the apostles. And I commend you to you the example of Andronicus and Junia. Isn't that great? Like I said, I don't know if I'm right in all that, but much of that is heartwarming and we need them even today. Any other comments or questions on that? You say, man, you sure are getting a lot out of this. Well, I know. I was kind of doing that. And I was going, man. I was going, whoa, I thought we could blow through this real quick. I think there's lessons here. And Flatius, yes. Oh, just because they were, they were in the faith before Paul? And uh, I don't know, that's speculation. But we know that Christianity started in Jerusalem and spread out and part of that spread. You know, here you are in Jerusalem. When I, was, when I teach the book of Acts, I'm always impressed with this. Um, here we are in Christianity in the first beginnings of it and at uh, Pentecost, 3,000 people come to faith. Well, you know, that's a nice church. You got 3,000, you know, all of a sudden you got 3,000, okay? And so, uh, what has God already told them in Acts 1 8? Be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and uh, Samaria, and to the other parts of the earth. They already got their, uh, their orders. And so, but, you know, they're not doing anything, they're not even starting yet. And so what, here is a young church, many people in it, three, at least 3,000 at the beginning, just at Pentecost, and they're adding to it every day, it says. And so can you imagine the headache that the, the apostles are, how to gather them in church, in, in church houses, on, uh, over 3,000 people, and this, that, and the other, and coordinate all that. Of course, they were meeting in the temple area a lot. Uh, because they had, Jews had not figured out that this was a completely different, not just a different sect, but di completely different from them. Uh, and yet, and they really was, and it's true Old Testament uh, teaching. You should believe in the Messiah. Jesus is the Messiah. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, you have this persecution of Stephen, and then they start clamping down on Christians, and, and the Christians are now scattered uh, brand new, you know, not many days, and scattered out throughout. And you kind of go, boy, that is devastating. What a devastating thing to happen to the church. Not in God's eyes. Why? They were sending them out all over the place to share Jesus. If you guys are not going to do it voluntarily, guess what? I'm going to send you out through persecution. God is always in sovereign control. We may go, oh, man, how does that happen? Why is this happening? But he's using it all, ultimately, for his glory. And so you see him 
blowing up the church in the sense of the first century Jerusalem church so that they would send out. And it's not until Acts 13 when you find that there's churches are being established and they got to go up to Jerusalem to bring some people down just to say, hey, is this okay? And then they had to go find this guy named Paul, Saul, Saul of Tarsus, to come help. <laughs> And you know, it's in Acts 13 from the Antioch church that then missions start. Man, I'm now in Acts, aren't I? Supposed to be in Romans. But you can see then how the church was involved there early on, uh, before even for Paul's conversion set. Well, time is, is, is uh, fleeting here, and so... Next time I'll finish this up and we'll continue on to try to finish uh, the book of Romans with me. And those of you who make it to the end, I will call you blessed that held on for three years on that. Let's, let's pray. Father, thank you so much. I was greatly surprised, and I shouldn't have been, Lord, how even in mentioning names in the church of Rome, there is great lessons that we can learn. So may we eat of the word, every parcel of it, and rejoice in your great goodness. May there be true fellowship among this group, Lord, that we demonstrate what we have learned today as Paul begins to mention different saints within the church of Rome. May we be those kinds of saints. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.